Every profession has its pitfalls, and preaching is no exception. It's very tempting for a minister to use the pulpit as a place where he can indulge himself in talking about what the playwright Henrik Ibsen's Hedda Gabler once called his special subject. When I was living in London, I used to attend a little Anglican church. The vicar was a delightful old man who was, however, fascinated by hagiography, the study of the saints. So every Sunday would find him holding forth in one of those venerable figures, no matter how obscure. I sometimes used to think that if a disaster of monumental proportions had hit London during the previous week, Sunday morning would have found our beloved vicar expounding on esoteric figures like St. Vitus or St. Elmo. The Bible doesn't do that because it must have struck you that though this is considered one of the holiest books in our possession, its pages are chock-a-block with flesh and blood characters and with stories that are set in very down-to-earth situations. And there's no better example than that story of the meeting between Jesus and the woman at the well. The whole incident is peppered with language that's refreshingly human. It's about people who are tired and hungry and thirsty. It's about buckets and wells and places to worship. Perhaps, perhaps that's why it's a story that never fails to grasp our imagination and to intrigue us. The two characters in this encounter are Jesus and a Samaritan housewife. The gospel doesn't give her a name, but personally, I've always thought that she should be called the artful dodger because she ducked and evaded everything that Jesus said to her. Just like those folks that you meet from time to time who don't have very much use for organized religion, but who love to argue about the Bible. Because haven't you noticed that it's almost impossible to pin them down? Just when you think you've made an important point, they'll nimbly duck, leaving you to defend some obscure verse from the book of Obadiah. Just when you think you're making headway and that you've nailed down your argument, they'll parry with some statement made by Hezekiah in the second book of Chronicles. And that's very much the way things seem to be going during that dialogue by Jacob's well between Jesus and the artful dodger. Listen again to the conversation, and you'll see what I mean. Jesus wants to explore the deeper things of this life. He wants to talk to the Samaritan woman about the spirituality which God alone can bring into our lives. He calls it a living water, which opens us up to the promise of a wholeness and a completeness that can make us truly human. But every chance she gets, the artful dodger dodges. First, she tries to sidetrack the master by getting involved in a discussion about history. Now, that's always a useful decoy in any argument because we're all separated by some kind of history, whether it's national or racial or personal. This woman was a Samaritan, which means that, like Jesus, she was a descendant of Abraham and Sarah. But the Jews considered the Samaritans an inferior race. You see, years before, they had allowed themselves to become tainted by foreign blood, because in the year 720 BC, Samaria had been invaded by the Syrians. Yet though these Syrians were the worshippers of false gods, in time, the Samaritans began to intermarry with them, and in the eyes of the Jews, this was an unpardonable sin, since they had allowed their precious Semitic purity to become contaminated. And though all this had happened some seven centuries before the birth of Christ, the quarrel between the Jews and the Samaritans was as fresh and as bitter as ever. So as the Galilean reaches out to her artful dodger, she tries to distract him by reminding him of the history that separated them. How is it, she asks, 
that you, a Jew, can have any dealings with me, a Samaritan. The events of the past have irreparably separated us. Doesn't that sound all too familiar? Doesn't it sound like the kind of exchange you might expect to hear between a Roman Catholic and a Protestant in Northern Ireland? Doesn't it echo the language being used between Arabs and Jews in the Middle East? Don't we hear the same conversation being repeated in America between black and white, rich and poor, liberal and conservative? Isn't it far easier to avoid all the challenges of reconciliation by retreating into the past, by unearthing former dif differences and refighting old battles? When the topic is history, we're all experts at using the wiles of the artful dodger. But somehow Jesus must have made it clear to our Samaritan housewife that he had come into the world to bring us together and not to scatter us into opposing camps. Because later in the conversation, we see her switching her tactics and trying to derail things by getting involved with an argument about religion. Now, if anyone is looking for a more fruitful subject for division and debate, there's none better than the matter of theology. And there was no more fertile ground than the difference between the Jews and the Samaritans. On the face of it, they had a great deal in common because they both acknowledged the same God. So it wasn't who to worship that separated them. It was where it should take place that had built the barriers. Our fathers, said the woman, commanded us to worship on Mount Gerizim. But the Jews say it should be in Jerusalem. So you tell me, which is right? I can imagine the artful dodger stepping back after a lunge like that, justifiably proud of her latest maneuver. It looked as though she had backed Jesus into a corner from which it would take hours of fancy theological footwork to extricate himself. This woman may sound like a lamb, but she fights like a bear. And once again, doesn't her language have a familiar ring to it? Because we're all still bedeviled by arguments over the right ground on which we can find God. We're still bogged down in trying to restrict his presence to this place or that, to that occasion or that, to this ritual or that. And we continue to blind ourselves to the revolution that Jesus was bringing into the world when he declared that because of him, all our man-made rivalries were coming to an end. The day is already dawning, he said, when I will be drawing people of all sorts to my side, thus opening up the possibility of a time when all of us, young and old, urban and rural, gay and straight, Arab and Jew, Christian and Muslim, all of us will be gathered out of our favorite places of worship and united in the Catholicity of his redemption and his reconciliation. So this woman had tried to, to use historical disputes as a shield against the unsettling words of Jesus, and that hadn't worked. She tried to use their religious differences, but that too had failed. And her last desperate attempt to avoid his searching and his probing is when she resorts to what can only be described as a kind of jaunty impudence. The subject was water. Not an unexpected topic, considering they were both sitting by an ancient well and that Jesus had begun his conversation by asking her for a drink. But quickly he had moved on to use metaphors that were distinctly uncomfortable because he was talking not about our surface wants, but about our deepest needs. The water from this well, he said, will never bring an end to your thirsting, but whoever drinks of the water that I am giving will never thirst again. And at last, the woman felt cornered. This conversation was becoming far too personal and far too penetrating for her liking, so for the first time, she resorts to a tone that borders on impertinence. 
Fine, she says. Give me this water of yours, for with this eternal spring at my command, I shall never again need to come and draw water at Jacob's well. And all at once, the shadow boxing is over, and with a frankness that is unnerving, Jesus drives to the heart of the matter. Go get your husband, he says. And though it was the middle of the day and the sun was at its blazing height, the air between them must have frozen solid. I have no husband. No, indeed you don't. The truth is that you've had many of them, and the man with whom you're now living is not your husband. Suddenly everything is out in the open, and our artful dodger can dodge no more, because standing in the presence of the Christ, she's finally forced to recognize the emptiness in her life. The skeptics have often wondered how Jesus could have known about all those men in her past. Did this prophet from Nazareth have some kind of crystal ball? Is this some sort of hocus pocus? Actually, it was probably a brilliant piece of deduction. Consider for a moment all the clues he had been given. It was the middle of the day when the sun was scorching, hardly the time when a woman from the village of Sychar, which lay about half a mile away, would have chosen to fetch water. That was always done early in the morning. And anyway, anyway why come to Jacob's well when Sychar had a well of its own? Seemed reasonable, therefore, to deduce that our artful dodger was considered a moral outcast by her neighbors, forced by her lifestyle to draw water at a time and at a place when none of the other women would be around. And it was then that all the sparring ended. Our artful dodger was finally in the presence of the naked truth, not about her history or about her religion, but about herself. She saw how often she had tried to find satisfaction in what this world has to offer. But now, in the presence of the Christ, she sees her need for that living water which can only come from God. No wonder she takes off for her home in Sikha to tell her neighbors that she may just have found the long-awaited Messiah. But what about us? Is it just possible that as we've been exploring this encounter between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, that we too have felt a stirring in our souls that has helped us understand our own desperate need for something that will satisfy the aching emptiness in us? Because somehow we've come to learn over the years that that em emptiness can never be satisfied by any of this world's glittering prizes. Nor can it be answered by a higher moral standard or by fulfilling a set of churchly obligations. These only meet our surface wants and not our deepest needs. And it certainly can't be filled by winning any arguments about God or about our religion. No, this is a craving for a peace that will quiet all the warring within us and all the warring between us is for an order that will make sense out of all our inner confusion, for a light that will illuminate the darkness in us and for a direction that will give purpose to the aimlessness of all our wandering. Because the truth is that it's only when we've drunk deeply of God's living waters that the struggle for light and peace and purpose will ever have come to an end. It's only when we've given up on all our artful dodging, that this thirsting in us will at last be quenched. Amen, and thanks be to God.